So our second presenter is Doug Holland. Doug, uh, Doug, Doug has been a long-term member of Fort Collins Skeptic in the Pub and Lyft. Can you tell us what the acronym is? I know with Lyft, uh, Leaders in Free Thought. Uh, I were an organization at CSU back when I was in my second degree. Doug has a master's degree in public administration and degrees in computer science and political science. He currently talks to angry people for a living. <laughs> He's going to talk today about the psychology behind such things as mysticism, pseudoscience, and conspiracy theories in order to focus on ways to persuade people away from these things. Oh. Yay! Yay. All right. Okay, well, we're going to start with, uh, yeah, basically, I mean, I mean, we're here to talk about, you know, people, you know, the kind of things that people believe in. You know, the point. Uh, there's a gentleman with his wily coyote rocket. Um, no, you know, you know, we also have you know, suicide, mysticism, you know, paranormal phenomena. You know, the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park had a little bit of fun. Yeah, a lot of it is fun to talk about. I mean, you know, but one of my questions here is uh, what makes people believe in this stuff? That's question number one. And another and another question that comes up is when you start looking at the beliefs that aren't so funny. I mean, you got you know, the anti-vaxxers, uh, you know, climate change deniers. Uh, yeah, now we're getting uh, characters uh, that are you know that are just smearing you know the survivors of the Parkland school shooting, the mass shooting, and just you know they've gone through all that, and all they have these people you know you know, attack their reputation. I mean, you've got. You know, toxic religion, you've got Holocaust denial, you know, people teaching creationism in public school, you know, just throwing <coughs> our kids full of nonsense. So the question is, uh, how do we fight this stuff? So, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, why people are drawn to these sorts of irrational beliefs. Uh, why do people resist uh, being, uh, you know, you know, being persuaded when we just present them with facts? And you know how how do we reach them? How, how can we reach them? Um, and really, it comes down to psychology. I mean, why do people believe in conspiracies? For example, a lot of it is just a need for understanding and certainty. I mean, I mean, you know, talking about evolution and creation, you know, the Big Bang, uh, quantum physics, uh, nuclear reactions. Uh, you know, DNA mutations, you know, it's all messy. We don't know anything. It's much easier to just say, God did it. Yeah, so a lot more certain that way. Um, also, people need uh, control and security. I mean, and this is especially true for people who, you know, who feel marginalized, you know, like you're unemployed or or your part of minority group, or you're living, you're, you're living in poverty, you know, and, you know, that makes people more likely to be attracted to this kind of thing. So, also, people need a positive self-image. Um, you know, when you think you're in the in-group, you know, when you think you're in on the secret, you know, you, that you're special, um, you, know, you, know, you know, that's, that's attractive, isn't it? Yeah. And a lot of it is just, you know, related is tribal psychology. I mean, <coughs> I mean, there's people that believe this, and there's also a thing called the blue lie. I mean, a lot of conservatives may not actually believe that global well, climate change is a hoax, but they hang around with the people who do, and they want to be part of the group, so they'll say that they believe climate change is a hoax. Um, you know, and we also have a number of cognitive biases. Um, you know, and, you know, like we have illusory power perception. Like, you know, I mean, you go outside, look at the clouds, look, look, there's an elephant. You know, or you flip a coin 20 times, and then you look at the patterns of heads and look at the heads and tails. Well, do you see a pattern? Well, maybe you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you also have false attribution of agency. Oh, well, you know what? This big complex process happened, like say evolution, the human mind, you know how the human mind came into being. Well, well, it's a big complex thing. Someone must have designed it, right? Um, you have know, yeah, confirmation bias. That's very common. You know, you look for things that confirm your existing beliefs. Uh, everybody does it. Um, 
And, and also you have proportionality biases. You know, big events have to have big causes. It can't just be due to randomness, right? Or, you know, people, you know, people will try to bring a cause even though it doesn't actually exist. And so, you know, a lot of it is, and so the question is, why do people resist when we state facts? When we say homeopathy, it's just water. Um, people, you know, people resist it. A lot of it is, you know, the backfire effect, and you know, this is, yeah, you know, this is, you know, well proven in psychological circles. Um, when you tell people facts that dispute uh, a core belief, uh, you know, something that they believe strongly and that's deep seated in them. You know, when you when you contradict them, it doesn't make them less likely to believe that thing. It makes them more likely. You know, they dig in their heels, they resist. <coughs> you know, for a lot of people, debate and reason, you know, isn't re you know isn't really a search for the truth. It's a game that would be won, and damn it, they have to win. You know, it's, you know, it's part of being human. I mean, anytime you know when someone. You know, contradicts you, presents evidence as against something you believe. You perceive it as an attack. And you know, when you know when doc, you know when researchers looked at people seeing uh, contradict political beliefs that contradict their you know, contradict their own, and watch their brains in an MRI machine, you know it. You know they see the amygdala lighting up. You know the ration, reasoning centers are go to the amygdala, the fear center of the brain. So people. Re People react to say someone stating that God does not exist. You know, in the same way you would react to a physical attack. You know, and this brings us to one of the effects of the backfire effect is motivated reasoning. I mean, this is logic on Ken Ham. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people don't reason to find the truth. You know, they reason to quash their own cognitive dissonance. You know, they, you know, this is, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, confirmation bias at work here. Rather than seeking uh, evidence and seeking, you know, you know, seeking logic to find the truth, they seek something to prove their own argument and to disprove the other guys. You know, people, you know, you know, they're they're seeking to protect their own self, you know, self image. They're protecting their ego. You know, you know, when you t nobody wants to nobody wants to be told you're wrong. Nobody likes that. You know, it's an attack. So you know, so they they rationalize to you know to prove what they already believe. So it's like so. What does work? You can't just you can't just throw facts at that doesn't work. Uh, so part of it is uh, who's familiar with the uh, Socratic method? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, rather than just stating facts, you know, you don't you know the you know classic teacher is the sage on the stage uh, rattling facts and okay pop quiz. You know that's you know nobody you know, nobody remembers that. Um, you know so what you do is you ask questions. You rather than making it confrontational, you create a dialogue. You know, so rather than, you know, rather than stating facts, you ask questions. Okay, you know, you make this assertion? Uh, why do you make this assertion? Okay, you say that David Hogg is a crisis actor? Where did you hear that? What's your source? Mm, you know, and really the idea is, you know, you know, you think of it as a scientific process. You create a hypothesis with the person you're having the discussion with. And you ask questions to try to either prove, you know, to... And part of it is you're, you're trying to prove the null hypothesis, so to speak, or to disprove the hypothesis. You know, and really the art here isn't really so much to tell them they're wrong, but to make them realize it for themselves. You know? So that's you know, so you you know, you ask questions, you probe, find weaknesses on the argument and see if you can get them to realize them. And you know, then you disguise the hy hypothesis, ask them more questions, lather, rinse, repeat. Yeah, that's one thing. You know. And another thing is you, you know, coming out political science and, you know, and from the campaign trail, I mean, you know, there's the good old-fashioned art of persuasion. One thing you want to do is keep cool, don't insult. If people are angry, they are not open to, percept to persuasion. And then, you know, another way to go is you 
want to go with the classic uh, Greek methods of argumentation. They they made an art out of it because a lot of times when people had to go to court, you know, they had to represent themselves. They had to persuade the members of their community uh, of their arguments. Otherwise, they can be exiled. They can lose their homes. They get executed. So they got good at it. <laughs> and you know, so you got logos, pathos, and ethos. You know, logos is logic, which we should all be good at here. Um, make logical arguments. Uh, you present evidence. Uh, you make inferences from that evidence, deductive or inductive. Then you show your work. Yeah, and that's all good, except the problem is we are not Vulcans. We are not, we are not always logical. So that brings us to step two of persuasion, which is pathos, the appeal to emotion. I mean, I mean, you know, in a high school forensic forensics debate, you're not supposed to do this, but in the real world, it works. So do it. <laughs> Trump won partially because he cheated, but partially because he appealed to fear. It worked. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, and you appeal, you appeal to emotions. Like for example, if you want to get an anti-vaxxer, you also appeal to their values. Um, you don't just say, "Well, you're gonna kill your kid if you're gonna do it." But, well, you you want to approach it. You reframe it a different way. It's like, "Well, why are you against vaccinations?" Well, you want to pr protect your children. Um, let me ask you a question. What do you think is the best way to protect your children from horrible diseases? Yeah. Oh, where, where is the evidence for your argument? You know, then you know, maybe they become a little more open to it. You know, the last part is ethos, you know, the argument from character. I mean, part of it is, uh, you know, part of it is you, know, you, you can cite experts. You know, experts are known to have good character. You know, they're known for making good arguments so you can use their arguments, although you don't want to overuse that because you know, just a strict uh, appeal to expertise, you know, without showing, you know, without showing your work is, you know, is not always good, but, you know, showing your work is also an ethos argument, you know, you know, like you cite your sources, for example, in an academic paper, um, you know, you show your work, if you, you know, if you did what, you know, if you did what, uh, what's her name, that girl, girl did and you know did you know did the experiment on the healing touch and and you know did it block you know did it as a blind experiment took the numbers ran the statistics got the p values well, well there's ethos in that mm -hmm. and then another thing to remember is we all have the backfire effect when you're told you're wrong um, you're all go you're all going to end up. You're all going to end up uh, you know, digging in your heels, resisting. Everybody does it. We're all human. You know, it's wired into our amygdalas. So that's something to keep in mind too. Is you don't want you don't want to let that get the best of you because otherwise, well, you know, then you fall into the same traps. <coughs> so um, anyway, I think I went a little too fast, but uh, I guess now we get to questions. <coughs> Hmm. Alright, questions? So, what do you do um, when you're dealing with someone like a Christian mm -hmm. who um, very deeply believes that they're trying to help you, right? Because the, the, biggest, the biggest thing with um, talking to someone who's very um, religious is that they actually believe that they're like able to save you mm -hmm. in, in whatever regard it is, whether it's Christianity, Islam, or something else. Well, part of it is, well, you can go to the Socratic method on this. Okay, I appreciate that. You're trying to help me. Um, how is it that you wish to help me? Um, how does this help me? Um, 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 is there really evidence that this helps me? You, you, know, you, you, you ask them questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the whole thing is faith, right? Like when it comes to religious belief, it's they don't... Want, they don't need evidence, right? They they say um, that they believe it because like they feel it. They believe it because um, it's written in the Bible. This is like the holy word, word, and that's enough for them. Right? Okay. All right. So yeah, why is faith enough? Mm -hmm. Why is their faith any better than any other? Like mm -hmm. they come up with an right. argument that you yeah know, for why yeah. someone should yeah, take their faith 
you know, rather than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Like same arguments used against theirs that they're using against everybody else. Yeah. See, so, yeah. For example, you can tell a Christian, well, you know, the Muslims, you know, they, you know, they believe in their religion, and Allah, and they believe that when they're spreading Islam, they are trying to help you. Um, what makes Christianity different from Islam? Well, then they would say because it comes from Jesus. Okay. I mean, they recognize. Yeah. And <laughs> well, <laughs> that would be a lot of also believe in Jesus. You know, they know Jesus is a prophet in the Muslim religion. Um, um, what, ma you know, what makes it spe him special in Christianity, but not in Islam? I mean, the well, Muslims son of God. Jesus. Revere Jesus. He's the Son of God. Okay. Uh, I did it. Boom. <laughs> okay. Studentally, I think you can just accept, okay, this is a nice person who's honestly trying to help me. Mm -hmm. And if you want the moral high ground, then you have to be honestly trying to help them. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means, right? So, you know, I think if you keep focused on on that, then it's it's easier to navigate sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rather than like, oh, I'm defending science, or I'm <coughs> you know, like, what would be helpful to this person right now? Like, maybe maybe they can't go all the way to you know flipping around but yeah. somebody did a chart once that there's 17 kinds of creationists mm -hmm. wow. from um, the ones that say well yeah evolution is real but maybe God created evolution and then is just letting it run because it's part of the plan right that's sort of like one end the other end are like the, 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 the flat earth and yeah the sun stopped for Joshua and all that stuff total literalists and then there's a whole bunch of stopping points along the way, right? So maybe you can't totally cure somebody in one step, but maybe you can move them one bump over. Mm -hmm. And that's a victory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's Make them think a bit, yeah. Yeah, figure, yeah, out, figure yeah. out where they are on that spectrum. Yeah, if you have the discussion, they might be per, not be persuaded right in front of you, but it might get the gears turning. So, so here's a question. Is religion inherently wrong? Um, it, 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 what is it? It, um, it depends on the religion. Dangerous. Yeah. Well, there's toxic religion. You know, my example would be uh, prosperity gospel. Jim Baker, Matt Robertson. If you're rich, that means God likes you. I consider that to be toxic. You know, it sends the wrong message. You know, it. it you know, it's it's a religion designed to get little old ladies to sign over their social security checks to to multimillionaire televangelists. There's also the uh, Harvard uh, uh, experiment they did on um, heart, uh, open heart surgery patients, uh, where they uh, were trying to determine if prayer actually <coughs> happened. Um, and they had some patients that were prayed for and some that weren't, and then some that were prayed for and told, and some that were prayed for and weren't told. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. that weren't prayed for weren't any healthier than those who were prayed for. Those who weren't told that they were being prayed for were the same as those who, those who were prayed for and were told they were prayed for had a 17% higher rate of uh, complications. Yes. Oh. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, bottom line is if you're going to pray for somebody in the hospital, don't tell them. I don't know. I've seen that. Do you think that's the back of my statistics books? And I don't know that they really have to theorize why that affects the Yeah, I think it's called the only thing that I've been able to come up with as an explanation for why that affects my hospital books. Uh, I just say you your head on my hell. I think a lot of it may absolutely pray for you. Okay, so you can perform. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah is Mr. Caleb Hendrick. He's going to be talking about the loot box. Uh, Caleb is a skeptic. He has this funny email. He said, I'm a former journalist and skeptic. I was like, so you're not a skeptic anymore. So I read that and I said, so he's a skeptic and a former journalist and a current video game player. His presentation today concerns a growing problem in the video game community and the video game industry of etc. Right. Agnosticism. 
Yeah. Oh, and by the way, while we're yeah. uh, doing technical things, uh, Susan is live streaming this on her Facebook page. So if you are friends with her, you can find her Facebook page. <laughs> you can share this on your stream and allow other folks that you may know to click in and, and join us. And also, I'm videotaping. And she's videotaping it as well. The, uh, I don't video. know how well you can see the little screen. The, the, the screen probably isn't coming through. So when you guys ask a question, please. Enough to get resistant. Don't think your nose is. Yeah, and like it, off screen, this is off screen, that's off screen. You can take your nose and spine off. Not right here. Like the mindset that I said these questions is. After Caleb's presentation, we'll take a break and then have this discussion. Steve, Tom, and what is your name? So, live streaming. Yes, but it hasn't been It's been running since years. That's it. Right. So, you see, I did. Oh, no. You know, good without God. Mm -hmm. You've heard that. Right? Yeah. And and so they, but um, they're like absolutist uh, atheists and relativist it's atheists. It's not quite so right. right? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, that's why I, I mean, uh, I don't trust you. That's, that's what I've come to. That's, that's basically what I do because I. Think of the you know? And like, how could you so yeah. 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 know the way? Yeah. Right? Okay, you guys. Have a little lunch, have the discussion. Okay. Okay, so as as you said, my name is Caleb Hendrick. I'm a skeptic and former journalist. I used to work in Colorado Springs. Um, and I'm going to be talking about video games, and that might seem like a bit of an odd topic for skeptics. It's not religious, it's not serious, per se, but there is a lot of skeptical topics concerning video games. And I, while my talk, while my presentation is about this per se, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the do video, do video games cause violence? That has been in the news recently, as our president mentioned it a couple months ago. Um, and, and in fairness to Donald Trump, he's not the first uh, president to mention this. Barack Obama also mentioned this, and not quite President Hillary Clinton also mentioned it in the 90s. Um, and there has been there has been a lot of study about this, and the evidence is at best inconclusive. There are some studies that say that people who play violent video games express a better aptitude for violence, and there are studies that show the exact opposite. Um, a, uh, more compelling, the, most, the more compelling evidence, in my, opinion, in my opinion, is a study from Texas A&M that found that some of the stronger predictors of violence uh, come from pre-existing conditions that someone might have. So if they've been exposed to domestic violence, or if they've been, um, or if they show some strong antisocial personalities, they're more likely to uh, they're more they're more likely to express violent behavior despite despite playing video games. Um, but that hasn't stopped some people from saying that video games are an instruction manual of sorts. Uh, Jer Jeremy Balinson, in an op-ed column for CNN, said this: you know, you know, maybe we could prevent mass you know mass shootings by not giving people a virtual boot camp in, uh, in, in violence. And his point was that. And his, his evidence was he cited an opinion by uh, Anders Brevik, the... Uh -oh. Oh, so how many people have the sci-fi ringtone? It's like the third one. Was well, 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 sorry, the mother sorry about that. I have to go. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, Balenson cited Anders Brannick, the guy who shot up a bunch of kids in, in I believe, Norway. Yeah. Um, basically, he said that, like, in his in his deposition, Brannick said that he wanted to use a holographic sight in his assault rifle because that would help him aim better. He learned that from he learned that from Call of Duty. It's not like he couldn't have gone and found someone who knows guns and figured this out, or looked at literally any any rifle used by the American military. Um, and uh, Balenson went on to uh, disparage virtual reality gaming. Um, you know, at the beginning, like, you're putting on the VR goggles, you're holding something that looks like a gun, and you're good. using it bang, 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 bang. Uh, well, that, well, I mean, to me, I mean, that proves that he hasn't actually ever played a VR game because the controllers themselves don't really look like guns, and really nothing in VR looks realistic at all. Um, and as someone who does play a lot of first person shooters, None of nothing he said. In my opinion, nothing he says has uh, weight, and none of his suggestions listened to. At least that's my opinion. Um, 
Basically, the issue is moot for me and for a lot of other gamers because video games don't display realistic violence and any more than disaster movies display actual disasters or comic books display accurate human forms. Um, but if you're interested, but if you're interested, I recommend watching this video by Jim Sterling. Uh, it's desensitized to violence. It shows it shows a difference between violence as it's depicted in video games and violence in real life. Specifically, it uses it uses the uh, suicide of Bud Dwyer, who was a Pennsylvania politician who committed suicide on live TV. And in case you're in case in case you're wondering, the trigger warning for this is that it shows up at a minute twenty in the video. And it, it's a pretty it's a pretty stark difference. It doesn't it looks way more realistic than it should be. Um, but uh, the moving on to my topic, uh, the debate over violence in video games overshadows actual legitimate debates we need to be having about video games, specifically concerning addiction. Uh, video games are uh, really good at hitting pleasure centers in your brain because it gives you it, it gives you an objective. It gives you the tools to complete that objective, and then it gives you a a reward for completing that objective. It hits the pleasure centers of your brain, you feel accomplished, and that gets you to just keep playing the game. That's not necessarily bad on its own, but many many video game publishers have been exploiting this for their own monetary gain. And that gets me to the loot box, a case for government's regulation of the video game industry. Uh, so we need to submit, so quick, just some quick important context. Uh, just in case you think this is a niche industry, uh, video games, as of 2016, had a player base of about 2 billion people. And it's predicted to ge it was predicted to generate more than $100 billion in revenue last year. And, that's, and that number is only expected to grow. The NASDAQ actually, so, actually uh, lists video, the video game industry as larger than both the music and movie industries. So lots of people are playing, and where there's lots of people and a lot of money flowing around, there's an awful... There's a um, better than normal, better than average chance that there are going to be hucksters coming along to exploit this. Uh, so some of my main arguments for government regulation is that, the that some of the practices that the industry is using right now, while not necessarily illegal, are certainly unethical. Um, and the video game consumers, that is, to, that is gamers themselves, are largely unwilling or unable to change industry practices through the purchasing power. And the industry, well, $100, $100 billion a year, a lot of money there. They're not really interested in changing this. And when consumers can't change a practice, and when an industry isn't interested in changing a practice, that is when I feel it's appropriate for the government to step in and uh, solve the problem for people. Uh, so we're going to start defining the problem. What is a loot box? Well, a loot box is a prize pack. It's something you can buy with in-game currency or with real-world money. It contains a randomized assortment of in-game items like weapons, healing items, power-ups, um, anything that might be used, anything that might be skins, sprays, anything that you might be able to use in the game. It's important to note that these are randomized. You don't know what's in a box when you buy, when you buy it. Um, and you don't, and you don't necessarily know the chances of getting a specific item because they're all spread on a rarity curve. So, really, really, really good items, like say the golden gun in Goldeneye, the thing that shoot, you shoot someone once they die, uh, that might be extreme. That might be a one in a thousand chance of getting. Or if you want to get a customized bow tie for James Bond, then you'll probably get a thousand of those per box. They're just super common and not super useful. Um, it's, essentially, it's, it's essentially a marriage between downloadable content, DLC, and a randomized loot drop. A randomized loot drop is something that's often used in massive multiplayer online games like World of Warcraft, or in RPGs or dungeon crawlers like, I don't know, Gold, like Gold, Golden Sun or, uh, or Diablo, something like that. You beat an enemy, it drops a bunch of stuff, you don't know what that stuff's going to be, it might be useful, it might not be, but it's your reward for beating that encounter. Uh, downloadable content is in-game content that's produced after the game is launched. So, game comes, game comes out, you play the game, and then a couple months down the line, the developer says, okay, now that you're done playing the game, would you be interested in buying this extra mission? Or would you like, would you like to buy these extra costumes for your multiplayer game character? The important, these are important because they're produced after the game is done. And they're released after the game has been released. And deals and uh, most DLC can be purchased through a micro through what's called a microtransaction. It's something you can. It's like if you want to spend 
couple bucks on something specific, you can do, you can do that. They usually um, come. They usually, they usually they usually it's downloadable content for maybe a dollar, couple dollars, and they have been known to be as expensive as a hundred dollars. So what's the problem? Well, uh, many people, ranging from consumers to politicians, have correctly interpreted that loot boxes are a form of gambling. You don't know what you're getting, you're paying real world money, or in game currency that you have bought with real world money, and you don't know what you're going to get. You might get something great, you might not get something great. And since the outcome is, un is uncertain, well, you're, you're gambling, basically. This doesn't technically meet the official legal definition of gambling, which the industry is very, very quick to point out. Um, and they, the industry is of the opinion that, well, you know, you, you know, can buy or be buy or beware. <coughs> we're gonna we're gonna put this out there. You can buy. You might not. Player choice. Uh, gamers themselves are uh, ga gamers themselves are split on the story of the issue, and experts are concerned. Uh, the Entertainment Software Rating Association, the, 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 <laughs> the Entertainment Software Association, that's the lobbying group that represents video game developers and publishers, they, set, they have this to say on the subject of loot boxes, quote, loot boxes are a voluntary feature in certain video games that provide players with another way to obtain virtual items that can be used to enhance their in-game experience. They are not gambling. Depending on the game design, some loot boxes are earned and others can be purchased. In some games, they have elements that help a player progress through, a, through the video game. In others, they are optional features that are not required to progress or succeed in a game. In both cases, the gamer makes the decision. Gamer choice, player choice. <coughs> this isn't gambling, this is your choice. Uh, gamers, as I said, are largely split on the issue. Um, some argue that if it doesn't affect gameplay, it's fine. This is the it's just cosmetic argument. They, you know, they're, they're, these people are of the opinion that, well, as long as it's just something that you know isn't going to make you better at the game, if it's just something that it just enhances your game experience, it's fine. Uh, but gamers are largely against. Um, in-game items that can help you win. They call this a pay-to-win. So, you know, they're against items that, like, hey, you're playing Call of Duty, you want to get a better gun? Spend a couple bucks, you get a better gun, and all of a sudden you're winning. They're really, really, really against that. But, as long as it's cosmetic, eh, eh, it might be bad, it might not be, we don't know. Um, experts believe that the loot box is exploiting psychological psychological if flaws and gamers in order to function. They argue that since loot boxes are akin to a poker machine-like experience, they're necessarily bad. They exploit. They're exploiting people that you know may not have the cognitive ability to understand the the uh, the issue behind loot boxes, i.e., children, or they're exploiting people with that have pre-existing addiction problems. People that have gambling addictions. People that have video game addictions. Uh, James Madigan, a PhD in psychology, uh, said to Game Informer in October of 2015, quote, humans are very susceptible, they can be influenced by rewards, uh, you see some sort of stimulus in the environment and you want to perform an action based on that stimulus and then you get a reward. And because you get a reward, you're then on the lookout for that stimulus in the future. That's basic psychology 101, classical conditioning, where you increase behaviors by rewarding them and decrease them by punishing them. He went on to say that, quote, the random element of these types of reward systems makes them that much more engaging because sometimes you get something and because sometimes and sometimes you get nothing, and sometimes you get something that is spectacularly awesome. The randomness <coughs> leverages the part that random, uh, that randomness leverages part of the, the way our brains are put together. We're se really sensitive to patterns and deviations from what we predict and expect to happen. Uh, Emil Hosdick, who runs the video game addiction treatment clinic, said, quote, if, you're, if you play Overwatch, a first-person arena type shooter that came out relatively recently, uh, basically every time you hit a level, you get a new loot box. And even though they're not said, hey, buy 20 bucks worth of loot boxes, what they're doing by you being exposed to the reward system, you are, in a sense, getting reinforced to be expecting something and getting a reward. Uh, they... they Experts have coined loot boxes a pay to loot system. Um, the psychological effect of loot boxes does have real world, co real world consequences. You'll probably see lots of stories about kids spending upwards of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of their parents' money on in game items. Mobile games are particularly notorious for this. Amazon has actually um, uh, refunded about $70 million worth of purchases to parents who didn't approve in app, in -app purchases for their kids. And 
moving away from kids, a Swedish gamer told local media back in February that he'd spent between 2500 and 3700 bucks to purchase player packs, loot boxes for a game called FIFA. Um, and he actually had to de he had to remove his debit his debit card from his gaming account so that he had to so that he wouldn't spend this amount of money. Uh, but so what? Um, so why why can't gaming companies just you know take these features out? Why can't gamers just you know not buy loot boxes? And do we really need the big old federal government to step in and fix this? Well, yeah, I argue I'd argue that we do. And, <coughs> To understand, to understand this, you're going to have to take a look back at business practices in video gaming because a loot box isn't just a random aberration. It's